Well, welcome back. Uh, this is a bonus material I promised at the end of the Tough Mind, Tender Hearts and Steady Hand dialogue I had with Alex Gomez Marin. And to keep the dialogue going, I really would invite you to give me your comments on my reflections here. <laughs> if you've just stumbled on this by virtue of the mysteries of the uh, YouTube algorithm, it won't make too much sense uh, unless you've watched the main video. So check the link above now, which will take you to that so you can partake of that and come back after you, you've finished it. This is the pudding, but the proof of this pudding is in the eating of the main course to mangle an idiom. So just to repeat what I said at the end of that video, that while working on the editing and post-production, another of my favorite quotes from Soren Kierkegaard came to mind again, the 19th century philosopher and theologian who said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Well, Ian McGilchrist and his emissary, Alec Gomez Marin, have given us much to help us understand our lives backwards so that we can live what's left of them in our mortal embodiment forwards with more assurance, confidence and insight. Well, my first reflection is that I noticed that the subtitles of the two books that Ian's published 12 years apart, and it struck me what the key challenges that we now face. The first book, The Master of the Emissary, was subtitled The Divided Brain and the Making of Our World. The second, The Matter with Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions and the Unmaking of the World. How is our unmade world going to be remade? Well, I have in mind especially the younger generation who have sought me out for guidance and anyone else that might watch this. What can I now say to you to hopefully contribute to enabling you to chart your course, trim your sails and float your boat on the oceans of possibilities to contribute constructively to the remaking of our unmade world? I have in mind especially one young woman in her 30s, Lawazi Ngudwane, because as I was scripting this, I got another attack of imposter syndrome with that voice inside my head saying, who on earth do you think you are trying to pontificate to young people and how they can live their lives forward? Well, at that very moment, the phone rang and it was Lawazi phoning just to ask me how I was doing. Now, Lawazi is a young professional architect with huge potential and ethical desire to make a positive difference and to be a role model to other young black professionals, especially women, she has found herself up against what I would now call, thanks to Ian, a very left-brain reductionist, simplistic, patriarchal and toxic culture that tends to view reality with, from a preoccupation with maintaining power. It's a mindset that has become a contagion in South African society amongst our leaders and I dare say elsewhere in the world. But Lawazi is one of those people I had in mind uh, when I was asking Alex for his wisdom as to what the young generation needs to hear to encourage them and nerve them. And Lawazi just called me to say how her options were now clarifying after our previous conversations and what choices she was now making to move her heads constructively. So I want to say thank you Lawazi, your voice has now banished the voice of doubt and I can now more confidently offer these thoughts as takeaways for other young people who are eager to set sail. Uh, and she's also helped me rehearse some of the issues that I have now got to offer. And the first one is, why have I titled this film Hello Yellow Brick Road? Well, this year happens to be, I discovered, the 50th anniversary of the release of Elton John's best-selling album, Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road. I was a mere 17 years old when that was released, and well, the wise was born long after that, and she wasn't really familiar with it, so I needed to explain to her that the Yellow Brick Road that Elton John sings about it has one line saying, I finally decided my future lies beyond the Yellow Brick Road. 
And that's from a classic American children's story, The Wizard of Oz. And of course, if you've watched the first major course, Alex and I spoke about that. But I realized it probably doesn't mean much to many young people. So let me again give the outline. The protagonist of the story is Dorothy, a young child growing up in a Kansas farm in the U.S. Corn Belt who gets sucked up into the clouds by a tornado. She finds herself in a fantasy land in the clouds on the yellow brick road. And on the road she meets three strangers whom she befriends. There's Tin Man, who lacks heart, Straw Man, a scarecrow who lacks a brain, and Lion, who lacks courage or will. The story was made into a Hollywood blockbuster hit musical and when my children were born they were greatly entertained by the four friends all singing their way along the yellow brick road as they go off to see the wizard, a wonderful wizard of Oz. Well when the four of them eventually get to reach the supposedly wonderful wizard of Oz he is nothing like they imagined. He turns out to be something of an insecure imposter a kind of mouse with a microphone to amplify his illusion. The point of it all is that it's the journey that is important, not the destination. The three friends are projections of Dorothy's own unindividuated self, and her befriending of her own heart, head and will is what the individuation process that Alex and I spoke about is really all about. Now, Lawazi found that interesting, and I certainly found it extremely interesting when I was in my 30s. So, understanding my life backwards, my 17-year-old self found the on-ramp eventually to Oz, and it was Hello, Yellow Brick Road. <laughs> well, Ian's book now is a really important aid to help us own our own full brains, hearts, and wills. It now occurs to me that we cannot ever really say goodbye to the yellow brick road. When we think we have reached the edge of consciousness, we realize there's always more. It's a bit like a Star Trek series, always going where, as one comedian said, where the hand of man has never set foot. By the way, if you know the Star Trek series, the three characters also embody those three archetypes. Cap Captain Kirk embodies the will, the steady hands. Mr. Spock, the head, the objective thinker, and the doctor, the heart, the empathetic, friendly helper. So, all you wonderful young people out there, stay on the yellow brick road. If you do find an off-ramp, you may well find it leads you to Hotel California, an addictive dead end, where you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. But how's this? It also now occurs to me that the yellow brick road is also a good metaphor for the part of the brain known as the corpus callosum, that band of neural fibers at the base of the brain that's in the middle and it connects the two hemispheres as well as other parts of the brain. In fact, Ian dubs it a superhighway. <laughs> and explaining the evolution of the brain, he writes that Clearly what animals needed was a superhighway connecting the two cortices and this is where the corpus callosum comes in. So Ian, if you ever get to watch this, I would love to know what you think of the yellow brick road as a metaphor for the corpus callosum. Interestingly for me, 17 years after Elton John's masterpiece, my corpus callosum superhighway spiraled my 34-year-old self up the mountain to a still deeper consciousness when I encountered another story with a strikingly similar structure, characters and plotline to The Wizard of Oz, except this is written for adults. It was a film released in 1990 titled Mind Walk. Produced by Bernd Capra, it's a dramatization of his brother Fritjof Capra's book, The Turning Point which was the next threshold in my individuation. And interestingly, like Dorothy making friends with her three friends on the yellow brick road, Mindwalk, Mindwalk also integrates the tough mind, tender heart, steady hands, trinity of archetypes. Except the setting is a beautiful Mont Saint-Michel monastery in Normandy in France. Well, the story in brief is that Jack, played by Tom Waterston, is a struggling U.S. politician who wants to try again to run for U.S. president. He's a practical, hands-on man of action, 
He flies to France to try and re-recruit his college friend Thomas to be his speechwriter, so to help him in his campaign to win the elections. Thomas is played by John Hurd, and he is very much the heart person, and he tells how he's left the USA somewhat disenchanted with the dogma e dogma world of US politics, and is living in France to try and find a deeper soul and meaning to life. Well, strolling around the monastery, they happen to meet a person who's the head architect, Sonia. She's a nuclear physicist, played by Liv Ullman, who also somewhat disillusioned by the appropriation of her work by the military-industrial complex. She's become a recluse, cloistering herself in this medieval sacred shrine. Sonia's one strand of connection to the world out there is her teenage daughter, Kit, who pops in and out of the story in the same way that Dorothy's dog Toto does in The Wizard of Oz to disrupt the flow and energize things. Kit thinks her mother's way too cerebral, encourages her to become more romantically involved, maybe with one of the men that she's just met. Well, this trialogue ensues between Jack, Sonia and Thomas, which is so well scripted to respectfully allow each character to express the gravitational pull of their own particular bias of head, heart, hands, and they dance, not literally, but figuratively. They come into a deep harmonia, as Pythagoras defines the term. Well, thanks again to Ian. Um, I have an understanding of that, because besides formulating theorems about triangles, I've learned that Pythagoras had some wonderful insights on the structure of music and harmony. Well, on Ian's channel, McGilchrist, he includes a fascinating interview he did with his brother Nigel, who is a scholar of ancient antiquities and has also recently published an amazing book on Pythagoras titled, When the Dog Speaks, the Philosopher Listens. In short, Nigel has collected all the fragments of what is known about Pythagoras and has written what is probably going to go down in history as another seminal work alongside his brother's books. And I think Pythagoras may offer us a signpost to the on-ramp to the yellow brick road. I don't think we need to look too hard for it, though, because if we journey in openness, in my experience, it seems to find us. Well, in my case, it was a road to Emmaus, uh, to a whole new exciting and mostly disconcerting experience of the sacred. But as the matter with things explains, it's better that our illusions are disconcerted. They are leading us into an abyss. And this brings me to my second point of reflection for discussion and comment. The sacred. I really want to thank Ian for sticking to the task of writing that part three, which is the unforeseen nature of reality. And for Alex, helping him to verbalize it. I know Ian struggled with that and took him a long time to write, but having read the final chapter of The Sense of the Sacred, I am inclined to introduce Ian as not just a student of English literature, philosophy, medicine, psychiatry, what have you, but also as a mystic. He confesses an ambivalent regard for Christianity because he finds it too dogmatic, which I fully understand and agree with. Well, I'm a cradle and cultural Roman Catholic and have also had to individuate from the institutionalized patriarchal culture of the Catholic Church, which I now understand has its own governance problems because it's also become very left brain in its triumphalism and dogmatism. But I remain Catholic and interested in the mystical tradition and find that there is, interestingly, a connection and in a connection, if you look at the mystical traditions of all faith traditions, somehow they all connect up. I even have a good friend who I have long conversations about this, who would describe himself as a mystical atheist. So in the context of a highly cynical, left brain literalist society, it seems to me, according to Ian, things only come to matter if they are expressed in a process of loving interrelationship 
It's about the rational and the relational coming together as indivisible complements of one another. And I think that's the nexus of the sacred. It's the bisection or the intersection of those two domains. And I prefer to use, because it's always somewhat mysterious, the term the divine mystery when talking about God. And to illustrate, going back to the Mind Walk film, one witnesses a, a wonderful emergent Trinitarian dynamic in the process that unfolds between the three friends. I'm going to play out with the climax, which is Thomas reciting Pablo Neruda's poem Enigmas to, to reconcile and harmonize the three energy centers. It ends with a line which Thomas expresses, which I think you could take away as a koan something you can contemplate and meditate on for a long time, because I've been doing it ever since I first watched the film 30 years ago, and will keep doing so for as long as my bionically reinforced heart keeps pumping and my corpus callosum superhighway keeps mediating the neural pathways between the parts of my brain. You ask me what the lobster is weaving down there with its golden feet? I tell you, the ocean knows this. You say, who is the Assidia waiting for in its transparent bell? I tell you, it's waiting for time, like you. You say, who does the macrocystis algae hug in its arms? Study it. Study it at a certain hour in a certain sea, I know. You question me about the wicked tusk of the narwhal, and I respond by describing to you how the sea unicorn, with a harpoon in it, dies. You inquire about the kingfisher's feathers, which tremble in the pure springs of the southern shores. I want to tell you that the ocean knows this, that life, in its jewel boxes, as endless as the sand, impossible to count, pure, and the time among the blood-colored grapes has made the petal hard and shiny, filled the jellyfish with light, untied its knot, letting its musical threads fall from a horn of plenty made of infinite mother of pearl. I'm nothing but the empty net which has gone on ahead of human eyes, dead in the darknesses fingers accustomed to the triangle, longitudes on the timid globe of an orange. I walked around like you, investigating the endless star. And in my net during the night, I woke up naked. The only thing caught, a fish trapped inside the wind. Pablo Neruda. Pablo Neruda. Does that remind you of anything? Walked around investigating the endless star. Isn't that what you do, Sonia? And in my net during the night, I awoke naked. Isn't that what you do? Don't you take your net and throw it out into these, these far out places of quantum physics and systems theory? And, and don't you find that the only thing you ever catch is your own self back again? like a fish trapped inside the wind. Where are the other people in your system, Sonia? Ones you love. What about these tourists here that we feel so superior to? Aren't they too like fish trapped inside the wind? And I don't know, maybe even the feeling's more terrible for them because, you know, they don't have words to describe it. So tell me, Sonia, where are all of us in there? The real people with their qualities, their longings, their weaknesses. Where are you inside there, Sonia? Where's Kit? You know, scientists can tell us what life's internal metaphors are, whether they're computer chips or clocks. Politicians can tell us what forms our lives should take. 
but uh, I feel just as reduced being called a system as I do being called a clock. Life's just, just not condensable. You know, one group of people uses one set of words to change the world, then another set of people come along with a different set of words to change it, and I don't mind. You know, it's all the same to me. I don't mind a bit. It's like the season's changing. And I like you. I, I like your timorous courage. I like the fact that you want to make the world a better place. God knows it could use it. And I like my silly friend Jack, who's crazy enough to think that he wants to be president of the United States. And as for me, <laughs> don't mind me, I'm a fool. But remember, life feels itself. Life feels itself. Differently, perhaps, than all your words for how to manage it. And even with the best intentions in the world, you'll go wrong if you forget that life, 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 life is infinitely more than yours or my obtuse theories about it. Healing the universe is an inside job. And you've helped me. And I love you. And I love you too.